respect to this particular item, did you um, weigh it as you normally would in some in an object like this? I did weigh it. Yes. And what did that uh, indicate? Um, this toothpaste tube weighed about 20.5 grams. It's um, so these are millimeter ticks, so it's really the size of a travel um, toothpaste tube. And that's sort of significant because, oh, excuse me, on the packaging, the toothpaste tube is labeled as weighing 17 grams. So this was sort of overfilled. It weighed more than what the manufacturer had stated it should weigh. So the toothpaste had been removed and some other uh, biological fluid or some other type of white, as you said, off-white fluid was uh, inserted into the tube? There was some other fluid inserted into the tube. So, yes. Photograph in um, Peebles 228 of the tube stated that uh, the item was passed to the defendant. There was no evidence uh, that the item was passed to the defendant. Is that uh, sufficient, Mr. Booker? Yes. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you. What did you do with the contents I performed um, some biological testing on that. So I began by taking some of the liquid and I used that to moisten a swab, which is basically a sterile Q-tip. And then I tested that Q-tip. I performed a presumptive test for seminal fluid. It's basically a chemical color change test. So you add certain chemicals and if seminal fluid may be present, they will turn a purple color. So I performed that test on the swab with the liquid and it did in fact turn purple. Okay. So that indicated to me that I needed to do more testing because there are some other, um, some other substances that will give you a positive chemical color change test. So the idea is that if you get a negative, you know that the substance you're testing for is not present and you can move on to something else. But if you get a positive, now that gives you the indicator to test more definitively for the substance you're looking for. Let me ask you a question. This uh, color change test, we've heard testimony in this case uh, regarding blood evidence. Is it a similar chemical test to one that would be utilized by experts such as yourself to test for blood? Um, a similar type color change test. Yes, the, um, the exact chemistry is, is slightly different, but um, the idea is the same, is that when certain components in the fluid we want to find are present, they will create a visual change in that chemical, and that will indicate that that fluid could poten potentially be present in whatever the stain it is that you're testing. So once you uh, got that presumptive positive result for semen, what did you do at that point? To so confirm? that led me to do to create a microscope slide from some of that liquid, stain it. So I added some of that liquid to a glass slide. I allowed it to dry. I added certain stains that would color the different cell types, and then I visually look for sperm cells using a microscope within that liquid. And I did in fact find um, a large amount of sperm cells within that liquid. Is there some type of rating system that you use based on the volume of sperm cells? There is a grading system. It's, um, it's not very defined, uh, but if you can find a multitude of sperm cells in each area, um, because you aren't able to look at the entire stain in one shot, you have to move the slide around to view the entire stain. 
So in each viewing, if you can see a multitude of sperm cells, we would rate that as a four plus, which is the highest. And then three plus would be a little bit less and maybe not in every viewing, that's a three plus, and a two plus would be less and in some viewings, and so on as it goes down. Um, so this particular slide rated as a four plus. And once you looked at it under the microscope, what is the next step that you did? So the next step was that I wanted to perform DNA analysis on the fluid with the sperm cells in order to obtain the DNA profile from that sample. And so subsequently, did you uh, do that so that you could proceed through to the DNA process? Yes, I did. Okay. Also, uh, sub subsequent to that time, did you receive a reference sample for an individual by the name uh, of Robert Baker. When we say reference sample again, we're talking about a known sample. Correct, and yes, I did. And did you receive that from uh, Randy Zapata, who works in the DNA section of the LAPD's crime lab? Yes, I did. And is he someone you've known for years from your work in the lab? Yes, he is. Bless you. He might have even been in one of my classes. Okay. And what was the form of the sample that you received from Mr. Zapata? It was um, basically a sterile swab as well. It's called a Bodhi swab, and Bodhi is just the name of the company that makes these swabs. It's a buckle swab, correct? Correct. And, and what is a buckle swab? A buckle swab, it's simply a buckle is an epithelial or non-sperm cell. It's called a buckle or buccal. And those line the inside of your cheeks. And so in order to collect this type of reference sample from a swab, you would put it in your mouth and rub it on the inside of your cheeks on both sides. And in doing that, uh, the swab would absorb cells from the inside of, <clears throat> excuse me, from the inside of your mouth. Now we've heard about the, uh, some of the, the steps in the DNA testing process. What testing kit did you employ in this case? Um, we use, our lab has uh, Fusion 6C validated for use. Okay. And is that the same testing kit that's utilized on the other side of the lab by the LAPD? Yes, it is. Okay. So you went through the same steps that they would go through, including the extraction, the uh, quantitation, amplification, and then the uh, analysis and detection, correct? That's correct. However. Exactly, however, um, I don't know what types of samples um, that were looked at at LAPD, but there's a specific type of extraction that's just for when you have a sample where you suspect there are sperm cells present. And I'm, LAPD has the same type of extraction, but I don't know if they performed, it's called a differential extraction. I don't know if they performed a differential on any of their samples. I don't, I don't know their case. But because I identified sperm cells in this sample, I did perform a differential extraction. Okay. And, and what does the differential extraction process uh, do? So ultimately what it does is it's able to separate sperm cells from non-sperm cells. So it takes this sample, and in this case, um, I put some of this liquid on a swab and put the swab in a, in a very small sterile tube to begin DNA analysis. So the way the differential extraction works is I added uh, specific chemicals that would only break open the non-sperm cells, allowing the non-sperm cell DNA to be released into solution while the sperm cells still stayed intact. So a sperm cell is a little bit different from a normal cell because it's designed specifically to travel through a hostile environment and then deliver just its DNA to an egg. So it's in sort of, um, it's in a capsule and that capsule is reinforced with sulfur bonds. It's just reinforced. So it's a little bit stronger than a normal cell. And we take advantage of that. And we're able to add those chemicals that will burst open the normal cells 
but leave those sperm cells intact. Okay. Once we do that, we're able to take the liquid that has the non-sperm cell DNA away from the sperm cells. And now we have two samples. We have a sample that consists of non-sperm cell DNA and a sample that consists of sperm cells that now we can add special chemicals to that will allow us to break the sperm cell capsule open and release its DNA. So we've created two different fractions or portions or samples from the one. And it's not, um, it's not exact. It's more of a, we're concentrating in this one sample the non-sperm cell DNA, and we're concentrating in the second sample the sperm cell DNA. And that's a, uh, the differential extraction is a standard process utilized by prim crime labs around the world. Around the world. In order to separate out, if you have a sample that you suspect contains semen, sperm cells, from the epithelial or the non-sperm cell fraction, correct? That's correct. All and right. it's, it's used because um, normally when you have a swab, and you're looking for the semen, it's from um, a part of someone's body, and uh, usually a mucous membrane, like the inside of your mouth or the vaginal canal. And those mucous membranes produce a lot of cells throughout the day. And so those swabs would contain a lot of non-sperm cells. And so that could potentially overwhelm. overwhelm the sperm cell DNA profile. So we have a better chance of seeing everything that's there if we're able to separate the two and then perform DNA on each one individually. Okay. So did you issue in this case a DNA report regarding what you did, your analysis, and the results you obtained that was dated September 8, uh, 15 of 2018? Yes, I did. And did you develop profiles, a reference profile for this uh, individual, Robert Baker, based on the evidence you were uh, provided by Randy Zapata? Yes, I did. And did you also develop evidence profiles, DNA evidence profiles for the sperm and non-sperm fraction from the liquid contained inside of this uh, toothpaste tube? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you make a comparison between the reference profile belonging to Robert Baker to the unknown uh, evidence profiles that you developed using that differential extraction? Yes, I did. And tell us your results, please. And let's start with the epithelial fraction or the non-sperm cell fraction. Absolutely. So uh, for the sample of the semen, from the toothpaste tube, the non-sperm cell fraction, I recovered a DNA profile consistent with coming from one individual. So it was a single source profile. And Robert Baker was included within that profile. I also performed some statistical analysis which will give meaning or weight to that inclusion, if I may. Yes. I performed what's called a likelihood ratio. And a likelihood ratio it compares two separate or varying ideas. Two One, hypotheses, basically competing hypotheses? Two competing hypotheses, exactly. So one is that given this DNA profile we recovered from the evidence and this DNA profile from this individual, how likely is it that this profile from the individual could have made up the profile that we recovered from the unknown versus I have this DNA profile from my unknown and a DNA profile from anybody else in the world, any profile I want, how likely is it that that could have made up this DNA profile? And when you compare the two, if it's more likely that the individual you're looking at could have made this DNA profile, then your likelihood ratio is gonna be larger. If it's not very likely, meaning that the genetic profile really doesn't match or it's not consistent with um, the deconvolution of your unknown. The interpretation, basically, of your unknown sample. Basically. Um, the interpretation of your unknown sample, then that would be an exclusion. And so in this case, 
You said that Robert Baker was included. That's correct. And the DNA profile is approximately 9 times 10 to the 28 times more likely if it originated from Robert Baker than if it originated from an unknown individual. So in terms of what that number means, um, within our laboratory at the time, any, any likelihood ratio greater than 1,000 is an inclusion. Any likelihood ratio between 0 .001 and 1,000 is inconclusive. Anything less than 0 .001 is an exclusion. That means this individual could not be the contributor of the DNA. So 1,000 is a one with three zeros, and that would give you an inclusion. This is a nine with 28 zeros. It's a huge number. It's not even just thousands of thousands. It's millions of millions. Okay. So it's very strong, um, very strong probability that, in fact, Robert Baker was the contributor of the DNA that we found in this profile. So once you uh, make that determination, th did you move on to the analysis of the sperm fraction of the uh, contents of that two -piece? Yes, I did. And what was your result? I found from the sperm fraction of the sample of semen from the toothpaste tube, a DNA profile consistent with coming from one individual, so a single source profile, and Robert Baker was included within that profile. The, I performed the same type of statistical analysis, and the DNA profile from the sperm fraction of the sample of semen from the toothpaste tube is approximately 9 times 10 to the 28 times more likely if it originated from Robert Baker than if it originated from an unknown individual. So you basically got the same uh, statist, uh, statistic from your uh, likelihood ratio calculation? Yes. And would that be uh, what you would expect given that you're talking about a single source sample? Yes. And, and given that um, in looking aside at just the profiles, um, they were both single source, they were both male, and they both were contained the same alleles. Single source meaning came from one person from as opposed to a mixed sample, like if you're talking about uh, when you mentioned the differential extraction, if you were talking about an item that was recovered, let's say, from a sexual assault kit that might have the victim's DNA along with uh, a perpetrator's DNA. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, and I'll never look at procreation the same again this time. Glad I could help. We have no questions. Thank you. Your excuse. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Everybody call the next witness.